Dr. Hi. Michael Wessels, welcome to Shrink Wrap Radio. Thanks, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm really glad to have you on the show. Uh, first of all, I have to say that I think you're doing really important work in the world, focusing on the global child refugee crisis. And uh, you've been working in, some, in hot spots around the world to intervene in the child refugee crisis. Uh, what are the countries that you've worked on, or worked in, I should say? Well, I've worked in a large number of countries, and primarily in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. You know, in, in uh, Africa, it's been uh, places such as uh, uh, Angola, Sierra Leone, uh, Liberia, uh, northern Uganda. In Asia, places like uh, Afghanistan, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, Timor, um, you know, and uh, currently in, uh, in Ukraine. And I've worked in uh, places like Colombia and Guatemala and Latin America. You know, one only wishes there were less of this work to do, truly, yeah. because it shatters the rights of children and tears people up right. in ways that uh, are hard to put back together sometimes. Yeah, and uh, I feel lucky to catch you <laughs> with all the travel that you do in this work. Uh, so I'm, I'm very fortunate to be able to speak with you. It is, in fact, a huge problem that you're tackling, and you've written that an estimated one billion children worldwide live in territories affected by armed conflict, predominantly in low- and middle-income countries. And I think that one billion figure is already a few years old. Well, that's right. It's a UNICEF figure, but it's a fluid figure. And I think if we take a look at uh, the crises in uh, Syria, South Sudan, uh, Somalia, Yemen, DRC, and uh, unfortunately many, many others, we find that uh, the numbers are, are on the increase. And so with regard to refugees and displaced people, we're dealing with over 65 million people, the highest figure since World War II. And UNHCR, the High Commission, UN High Commission on uh, Refugees, is about to release their 2017 figures, and they will be higher. So it's a huge problem. Yeah. So I have to ask, <laughs> what is your academic background that's prepared you to do this sort of work? I found myself asking, well, is he a child psychologist, an organizational psychologist, a community, community psychologist? Uh, <laughs> What in the world is your academic background? Well, it's a fair question. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I uh, earned my dissertation in experimental psychology, of all things, uh, from University of Massachusetts Amherst. But then I had a uh, Kellogg Fellowship in the uh, early 1980s that hooked me, connected me up with mentors uh, on uh, child development, community, uh, psychology, sociology, <clears throat> and anthropology, and I began a study uh, of different cultures and of children in different cultures. And I would say that the very best source of learning has come from the field. I've had the honor of working with people uh, in different countries for uh, several decades now. And what I find is that notions of who is a child of what is a well child, what does it mean to be well? Uh, what are the varieties of disorders or problems uh, that face, not to say that there are no universals, but learning to pay attention to the local context is terribly important. So my work is not as a clinician, but as a holistic psychosocial practitioner, which really uh, interconnects culture, uh, community, uh, livelihoods, and is really not therapeutic in, in, uh, in the specialized sense. Yeah, what an interesting preparation. Now, when you got that Kellogg grant, did either they or you have this kind of career path in mind? No, I mean, it's actually, uh, it was quite unexpected. For me, this was a calling. What happened was around the time I got the Kellogg Fellowship, I became a father. And I found myself looking at, thank you, looking at my wonderful son, thinking 
of all the preparations I was taking to make sure that he was well cared for, saving for education, getting all the you know, health checks and so on. But I felt that I honestly was not doing enough in the world. I was a long time peace activist and was very involved in the Vietnam protest. But once I earned my uh, doctorate and started teaching uh, on a full-time basis, I started doing my service work and my activism on an after hours basis. And it was my son who gave me the wake up call and said, uh, that's not enough. So when I got the Kellogg Fellowship, I had the opportunity to begin trying to take what, I'm le what I had learned and to bring it back into the discipline of psychology. And I did that by uh, working with a very talented group of people and helping to establish uh, within the American Psychological Association uh, a division of uh, psychology of peace and nonviolent conflict resolution. And then as part of work on that, I ended up uh, in the uh, uh, 1980s working in the Baka camp with, uh, in Jordan with uh, Palestinian youth, thinking quite honestly that I had very little to offer. I knew a bit about their his, his, history and uh, sociocultural situation, <clears throat> but I certainly was no expert. And I uh, did not you know, uh, qualify myself as a, a clinical expert, but they sat me down, David, and they, they told me, look, here are the things that we can do better than you. And I agreed with them. <laughs> and they said, here are some of the things that we can't do that you can do way better than us, like help to educate members of your society, and members of your government that Israelis have rights, Palestinians have rights. You know, it shouldn't be one, you know, is, uh, you know, gets more privileging than, than the other. And uh, so I, I took that quite seriously. And then it turned out that down the road from me, <clears throat> uh, uh, an NGO, a non-governmental organization uh, called Christian Children's Fund was beginning to do some work on peace education. And we were dialoguing and uh, I got more and more involved. And then finally they invited me to go to uh, a war zone and to use my skills of uh, methodology to try to help them conduct an evaluation. But it turned of a, of a, a fairly large scale program they were doing on psychosocial support for war affected children. But it turned out that in that evaluation, there was need for a stronger cultural orientation. And uh, they, the very talented Angolan team that was implementing it, really needed help from me talking with the donor, U the U.S. Agency for International Development. And so, you know, over time, I learned that there are some things like that that I can help with. And, uh, and so I became a supporter <clears throat> for these very talented national teams of uh, psychologists and psychosocial workers in uh, in different countries. And I got hooked. And I got hooked not because of the, uh, let's say, the, the moral strength and purpose one feels when doing this work, although that, of course, is a very important part of it. I got hooked by people's resilience and by seeing the ways in which people uh, found a way to uh, roll up their sleeves and to help each other even across political lines and boundaries. And in their moment of greatest need, um, you know, found a way to uh, stand up on their own and to begin walking a path of resilience. And, and that really inspired me. So I saw that there was a lot of self-help, there was a lot of help and support that was needed from outside, and there was a lot of work to be done on documentation and learning on the good things that people were already doing to help themselves. And uh, so I decided to devote a bigger, much bigger chunk of my professional life to it. And uh, that's where I am today. Yeah, yeah. Wow. What, what a path. And uh, I want to keep that resilience uh, theme live in our discussion because that was really the thing that caught my attention uh, when I think I read a piece about your work in the Psychology Monitor, or Monitor on Psychology, a short piece. And I thought, geez, I want to talk to this guy. Um, so you're still doing this work, right? 
Absolutely. And and who's paying your salary, if I may ask? Uh, one or more. What organizations well, do you work for? Yeah, I mean, I, <clears throat> I work as a consultant. So, for example, when I work in Ukraine, it's a UNICEF Ukraine that pays my salary. My day job, in addition to being a professor at Columbia, is really with uh, a um, coalition of agencies. We call ourselves the Interagency Learning Initiative for Strengthening Community-Based Child Protection Mechanisms. Hmm. It's kind of a mouthful. Yeah. Basically, psycho psychosocial support in humanitarian crises is administered through a uh, coordinating body called a cluster, and it's the protection cluster <clears throat> that has a, and specifically the child protection subcluster that does, that organizes all the psychosocial support for war affected children worldwide. And so uh, we've had a problem with too many, too much of the work on uh, child protection and psychosocial support being top down. That is, it is prescribed by outside psychologists such as myself. Um, and I would argue that our knowledge is important and valuable, but that sometimes we don't listen deeply enough to the strengths that are already present in the affected group. And so many outside psychologists come in and they look at uh, refugees and they see the difficulties of the situation. They think of the horrible traumas of an Aleppo or you know, other places in Syria. And they uh, think they do a quick rapid assessment. They took a look, look at maybe traumatic stress <clears throat> and then they uh, indicate an expert uh, driven intervention. And uh, I, I personally think that that modality of working is, is not optimal. It tends uh, not to build local on local resilience and on the strengths that are there. It tends not to start with self-help. And um, I think we get farther when we uh, begin with a more culturally grounded uh, approach. But I also want to be careful. There is a place for Western psychology. It's just that uh, I think we should not uh, lead with it. And I think that this is actually the spirit of the uh, first global guidelines on mental health and psychosocial support in emergency settings. Uh, I had the honor of co-chairing along with Mark Van Omeren of WHO, the, uh, uh, the task force that hatched those guidelines nearly a decade ago. And they actually helped to put mental health and psychosocial support on the international humanitarian agenda. So I just wanted to mention that this, this approach is not mine alone. It really is uh, the recommended approach from the global consensus guidelines. Okay, so it sounds like we've moved from a place of uh, well-intentioned experts uh, coming into a crisis situation and, uh, apply, uh, and applying specific therapeutic tools that they have learned that maybe work one-on-one -on -one or that work in this country. And instead, you've developed a broader framework uh, for intervention. In one of your papers, uh, you propose a framework that rests on three pillars of intervention strategy, and uh, they are comprehensiveness, sustainability, and do no harm. So I'm hoping maybe you can take us through each of these three pillars and kind of expand on them. So let's well, start sure. with comprehensiveness. So let me be a little bit uh, critical of international NGO work in this regard. Um, and all of the problems I'm going to identify are problems that have typified my work as well as everyone else. So I'm not placing myself up on some kind of moral pedestal. But when you work for an international NGO or you are hired as an outside consultant, typically the money that comes from donors is earmarked for particular uh, sectors or problems. So for example, you might get money to address uh, gender-based violence, which is a tremendous problem mm -hmm. uh, in most armed conflict and, and refugee settings. But <clears throat> if you come into a setting and you work uh, specifically on gender-based violence, imagine doing that in an Afghanistan where the gender norms are very, very strict 
and, and repressive. Those, if you start even naming something like gender-based violence, you can elicit a backlash from men that can make women's lives actually much worse, thereby mm -hmm. causing harm. And in terms of a comprehensive approach, you know, in a setting like uh, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, the Syrian refugee crisis, oftentimes the problems that people self-identify first are so-called everyday distresses. They say, we have no livelihoods. We're unable to uh, buy adequate food or to get adequate health care. Uh, we don't have adequate shelter. Uh, my children can't go to school. And uh, so some of these are things that really are uh, quite, uh, quite painful. The, uh, most of the people who work on psychosocial and mental health support do not work on livelihood and economic support. I would single this as one of the single greatest weaknesses of the whole sector of mental health and psychosocial support and child protection as well. And David, you can imagine why this is. You know, I'm trained as a psychologist. I don't feel right. particularly comfortable or qualified to speak as an economist. Yeah, I was having <clears throat> so lunch. What it means. I was having lunch yesterday with uh, with a friend who is a, a social work uh, professor, and social work yeah. as a as a discipline. He was telling me how they tend to have big binders full of resources uh, to help people find the resources that they yeah. need in their uh, communities. That's great. And so in some no, ways, what you're the need that you're describing sounds like that sort of an approach that's, that's needed in those areas. It does. It does. And I think you could even go maybe a step farther to deliberately working as part of a team so that, you know, you conceptualize your work in ways that uh, uh, harvest and, and build on the synergies of these different elements. <clears throat> and then in addition, education. You know, uh, in uh, psychology, oftentimes we don't, we view education as very important, but we don't take a look at its psychosocial impact. But in war zone after war zone, children and teenagers tell me that their single biggest need is for education. It is often a, a bit inflated in my opinion, <clears throat> but one can certainly understand why this builds a sense of normalcy, uh, a sense of social integration with your peers, and uh, a sense of hope for the future. And of course, the development of cognitive competencies uh, is one of the underpinnings of, uh, of resilience. But typically psychologists are a little bit less comfortable working in educational settings. So this too is part of a comprehensive approach. And then <clears throat> there's a whole uh, arena uh, around health that is really important for psychosocial well-being. So if you have stepped on a landmine and there are hundreds of thousands of children in heavily landmined countries such mm. as Cambodia, uh, Afghanistan, and so on, uh, who've, who've lost limbs, you know, they suffer not just from disfigurement and pain, but from social exclusion, from being left out feeling like they are somehow less than other people, unable to marry or fulfill a social role. This is hugely impactful. And so being able to work with, uh, with disabilities of, of all kinds. And then in places like Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, <clears throat> there are often spiritual beliefs that are at the center of psychosocial distress. And these uh, are not necessarily things that Western trained psychologists like myself uh, would be uh, prone to think about. So to give an example, I've, I've done a lot of work with child soldiers, uh, children who've formerly been recruited into armed forces or mm -hmm. armed groups. In Angola, in Angola, we met a 14-year-old boy with a gun, and uh, he showed a lot of problems, including what might have been symptoms of PTSD, although we were not doing formal uh, diagnostics. But uh, he was hypervigilant, you know, he had trouble relaxing, he was avoidant of certain things, and he had a lot of you know, intrusive re-experiencing, so uh, he had trouble sleeping. But my Angolan colleague uh, and uh, mentor, Carlinda Montero, she asked the boy, why, why do you have trouble sleeping? Mm 
And he said, well, the spirit of the man I killed comes to me at night and asks, why did you do this to me? And so he believed that he was actually haunted by an angry spirit of the man he had killed. And when Carlinda probed further, she learned that this man hailed from a, a rural setting where traditional beliefs were quite strong. And in those uh, areas, people believed that if you had uh, an angry spirit after you, that that spirit was all powerful and had the ability to make you ill or kill you or to hurt anyone you came into contact with. So if that former child soldier went home, uh, his mother or father could have fallen ill or could even have died. And the same was true of communities. So this affliction, this spiritual uh, affliction, which anthropologists often refer to as a form of spiritual pollution, is viewed as a communal problem. It is not something that resides between one's ears. You know, it is, it's not an individual problem. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, you know, well-intended well Western psychologists come in with a predominantly individual focus and don't look at the communal wounds, uh, which I think can, can be equally important. So, you know, if you put all of these kinds of dimensions together, it really cries out uh, for, as your social worker friend indicated, a team-oriented, multidisciplinary approach. And furthermore, when you, the security issues are often very, very big in these settings. So among Syrian refugees, you know, living in places like Jordan or Lebanon, you find that oftentimes one of their biggest concerns is that camps or areas where refugees live are controlled by local bosses. If you look at Ukraine, you find that uh, a lot of the humanitarian aid is actually across the line, you know, in the Russian controlled areas or, or Russian supporting controlled areas uh, are actually governed by oligarchs. And one cannot disagree with them without threat of expulsion or violence. And so, <clears throat> you know, there are these ongoing security issues that have to be addressed before any well-being can be achieved. Mm. But we have to find a way to address all of these. And I think one of the important ways to do it is to work as part of a multidisciplinary team. And if not that, to at least make connections with uh, service providers and to think about building the multiple layers of support that are inherent in the IASC uh, guidelines. So at the base of the pyramid, we think about interventions to meet basic needs for food, water, shelter, healthcare, in ways that support people's dignity. That means that if you're a woman with a child, you shouldn't have to collect your food by going and standing in hot, you know, a sweltering sun for five hours, uh, waiting to get your food ration. Uh, coming up to the next layer, there are family and community supports. A child soldier, such as the one I described, needs a lot of different supports, but they need to be reunified with their family through tracing and reunification. And uh, that will usually take some conflict mediation with the family. <clears throat> and in addition, they need uh, community reintegration and support so people in communities may fear them and their steps need to be taken to aid their acceptance by mm -hmm. the community. And then the third, you know, there are people who have uh, focused but non-specialized uh, support needs. So, for example, in Kosovo, I met a woman who just clung to me and she screamed and wailed for hours that she was losing her mind and she was crying and crying and crying. And the only thing that could be done, the best thing that could be done uh, was to provide psychological first aid, which, you know, as you know, is a form of patient supportive accompaniment, uh, not talking um, in, unless she wanted to talk, listening and trying to help her connect with local helpers and with uh, the kinds of support services uh, that were needed in her environment. But she needed more than anything else, some uh, sense that there were people in the environment who cared. And uh, she actually benefited from learning a little bit about the fact that what she was experiencing, even though her reactions were quite pronounced and extreme, 
these are normal reactions. I mean, who, who would not, you know, uh, react in that way if you had seen your entire family massacred before your eyes? I mean, these are, are human responses. And uh, I'm happy to say that that woman went on to get uh, some training in uh, ways of self-regulating and calming. And she also did uh, receive some specialized psychosocial uh, services. And uh, last time I saw her, she was doing, doing quite well. And then at the top of the pyramid, the smallest number of people, but uh, a group that numbers in the thousands or tens of thousands, are the people who are uh, rendered um, dysfunctional or who have such severe impairments that they require specialized uh, services by psychiatrists, psychologists, and other trained professionals. But you know, the problem is that in many of the war zones I work in, they are unlike Bosnia or unlike uh, Syria, there are no psychologists. Or there may be, as was true in uh, Sierra Leone, there was uh, basically uh, two clinical psychologists. The same was true of Angola, a very large country. Uh, in South Sudan today, one of the most brutal conflicts ongoing. Uh, you know, there, there's such a paucity of trained psychologists and psychiatrists that it becomes very difficult. And even if they are present, typically they, they provide their important services in the capital city. But people in outlying areas may not have the money to travel. It may be too insecure and dangerous. And um, so it becomes very difficult to make these referral systems uh, really work. And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, we're doing a little better on that in countries such as Ukraine, uh, thanks to the work of USAID's uh, Victims of Torture Fund and some of the work being done by uh, Paul Bolton and his team at uh, Johns Hopkins University. Oh. But all this is to say that the, the comprehensive approach is long and intricate. <laughs> yeah, I'll say it's very complex. And of course, the, the, speaking of those three pillars, the second one was sustainability, uh, which I assume is all about uh, you can get a, a program started, uh, but if it's only going to be in place for six months, that's not going to cut it. Well, that's right. Uh, David, this is the one that is maybe the most problematic. You know, it used to be that humanitarian workers said, we're really not here to build sustainability. We're here to save lives. And there's integrity in that position because one has to save lives in the heat of the acute uh, crisis. But the fact is that the average uh, length of displacement and of uh, concern for the people that UNHCR looks after is now uh, about 17 years. Uh, mm -hmm. Emergencies have become protracted. They become ways of life. And so we have to think about long-lived uh, supports or long-lived or supports that, that generate long-lived outcomes and uh, yield uh, ongoing benefits uh, to the people whom we're there to serve. And on this criterion, I give the humanitarian enterprise a flat F. Um, we need better models on, on how to do this. So the hegemony of this top-down expert-driven approach is uh, perhaps useful in uh, providing immediate response to someone, for example, who has horribly been victimized by gender-based violence or by child recruitment <clears throat> or is living in a situation of trafficking uh, or is engaged in dangerous labor or a child living and working on the streets. So I, I don't wanna to totally discount uh, this expert driven approach, but in terms of longevity of results, uh, the evidence is quite clear. These uh, projects do not persist and the average length of funding in an emergency is typically six months to a year if you're lucky, you might get 18 months of funding. And uh, typically one does not have the funding that's needed to address uh, the needs on the scale that's commensurate yeah. with the scale of the problem. Well, you I might think start you, in the capital you, city. You're subject to the whims of the very short news cycle and uh, political changes yeah, in uh, the various countries, right? And so the, right. the political will could, as we're seeing in our own country,
the political will could shift radically. Yes. <clears throat> so a better approach to generating sustainability is to enable real community participation and ownership. So the work that I'm doing with the Interagency Learning Initiative, as one example, is trying to help strengthen community-led child protection mechanisms so that communities themselves define what are the main harms to children, what are some of the supports that are there, but then what are the gaps, what additional supports are needed. And then they may ask for, they develop plans for intervention, they may need capacity building, they may need better linkages with social workers or with police or with uh, the education ministry or the health ministry. And uh, they begin uh, uh, doing the intervention themselves since it's guided by local people themselves and it's a highly inclusive process. It is not just the chief and his next of kin, uh, nor is it other parts of the local power elite alone. And because young people themselves have significant voice and agency in this process, uh, people see it as their work. So they find a way to make it continue. It's small money. It doesn't rest on you know, uh, paid work. It's almost all volunteer work. And it's sustainable because people care about it. It's kind of like parenting. You don't have to be paid to be a good parent. You mm -hmm. do it because it's a labor of love. Because mm -hmm. You care about your child. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <clears throat> So this, uh, the evidence that we're getting so far is quite promising uh, that this approach generates higher levels of community ownership. People do not say this is a Save the Children project or a UNICEF project. And at the end of the day, they tend to continue it. But I have to also say that our, uh, there's need for much more evidence. You know, one of the things that we seldom do, David, is go back five years after a crisis, 10 years after the crisis, and take a look at what endured. And we haven't even done, taken the most basic critical look. Is it really true that the communities and areas that receive uh, NGO, UN, and other outside support are discernibly better off a decade later? I mean, quite honestly, we don't know the answer to that question. Mm, that's fascinating. I know that uh, you have uh, <laughs> edited one or more uh, issues of the American Psychologist uh, describing uh, the state of research in, in this, the field of, uh, what would you call this field? <laughs> I don't, what's the name of this field? Child protection, and, oh. child protection and mental health and psychosocial support. Okay. And um, I remember reading that, uh, in the first paper of that, uh, which I think came from 2006, that psychologists were, uh, were just not involved in studying these sorts of issues, that for some reasons it wasn't attractive enough or supported enough. And I gather that's changed somewhat, but it's still a big issue. It has changed, <clears throat> but <clears throat> I would say that the whole field of psychosocial support in humanitarian crises is still new. Most practitioners would trace it back only to the late uh, 1980s. And uh, I would say it was guided by some very smart, hardworking uh, people, uh, but it was based primarily on practitioner expertise, which is a good thing, just as clinical expertise is very important. But you know, as we know, uh, there's a need for independent evidence, you know, that provides a, a higher standard of uh, empirical scrutiny. So uh, I'm happy to say that the entire sector now recognizes in a way that it did not 10 years ago, the importance of strengthening the evidence base, learning about what works, which interventions work, and why, which, which elements do the heavy lifting. And uh, and then trying to uh, use those uh, to, uh, to support quality uh, work um, that minimizes ethical you know, complications. And I think that for me, this is part of the ethic, ethical imperative of, of do no harm. But the problem that I just wanted to mention 
is that sometimes there's an assumption by Western psychologists that if we use tools such as the Harvard Trauma Questionnaire or some other widely used, predominantly Western questionnaire that has been used in multiple humanitarian contexts, that thereby we're somehow absolved from having to do validation studies to determine you know, its external validity in a particular cultural context. That I think is, is problematic. Uh, I think that we owe it to everyone we work with to do good science. Good science means uh, validating things in context. And my experience is that almost always uh, the tools that we take off the shelf from the West have some relevance and bearing in other cultures. Um, but it, it's somewhat simplistic to take them off the shelf and plug them in. We may be silencing cultural narratives and local understandings of some of the things that support child well-being. We may miss the really important things, like the one I described for that Angolan former boy soldier who said he was haunted by an angry spirit and who needed traditional cleansing and who benefited greatly when he received the cleansing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Western psychologists simply wouldn't think of that. There's no reason why we should. It's outside of our training. But I think <clears throat> part of our ethical obligation is to learn about the socio-historic and political context, the economic context, and the cultural beliefs, practices, and values. Not to romanticize them, but where there are strengths to build upon them. And yes. maybe where there are problematic aspects to maybe work for long-term social change. Yes. One of the <laughs> themes in what you've been saying has been do no harm. And are there examples that come to mind of in the past where well-intentioned people come in and apply uh, Western approaches or whatever, and in fact have unwittingly done harm? Yes, <clears throat> very definitely. So one of the worst circumstances I can imagine uh, occurred uh, following the horrendous uh, attacks of the uh, Serb uh, paramilitaries on Kosovar uh, people uh, back in 1999. There were large numbers of refugees in, the, in Albania, in, in the capital city of Albania, Tirana. There were uh, camps set up and I was there uh, learning, uh, going around for purposes of coordination to learn what other people were doing because one wants to avoid duplication of effort to learn what's working, what's not working. And I met a man from Texas who was a, uh, described himself as a uh, family um, you know, practitioner and a family therapist. And he said, I just knew that I had to come when I saw the horrors on TV I knew I had relevant skills. I knew people were torn up by this. I knew I had to come. So here was a man you know, who had given his life towards helping other people, who was moved by his compassion and his sense of moral agency, which you know, is, is wonderful, is a wonderful impulse. And yet he, he had not done his homework on the cultural context. So I asked what his intervention was. And uh, he said, well, I have this tent. And he said, I'm, I'm providing uh, therapy for survivors of rape, because there were large numbers of rape. The problem, David, was that, you know, as you, as you know, in Kosovar culture, uh, rape is viewed as a source of family dishonor. It is like a stain on the family. And horribly, the woman herself, the victim of the rape, gets blamed for this. And once she, it's known that she was raped, it's uh, not uncommon for the family for, to stone her to death. Mm. Uh, to remove, to recover from family honor. So I had the unfortunate, you know, obligation of sharing this, you know, uh, cultural reality with this gentleman and, and suggesting that he end, you know, that modality of working and that, you know, maybe a better way of working would be to talk with some uh, Albanian uh, people who supported families and to learn from them, you know, how to... Uh, learn to work together to provide general family support rather than support for survivors of, of rape. Um, there are many others. I mean, here's another one. In After the 2004 Asian tsunami, so we're now talking about large-scale natural disasters, which pose some of the same kinds of issues on a large scale. 
uh, people had lost everything in a blink of an eye. Family members, possessions, home, livelihoods. It was really quite awful um, in the immediacy and scale of the psychological uh, disruptions and losses. In Sri Lanka, the government had a very well-intentioned plan to support the large numbers of people uh, in the South who had, who had suffered uh, uh, in the tsunami. They said, what we'll do is we'll train a cadre of 10,000 uh, people on how to uh, relieve trauma. And so they were gonna give uh, these 10,000 people uh, one to two weeks of training. And the idea was that they would then fan out across the countryside, uh, make home visits and dialogue with uh, uh, trauma survivors uh, and would thereby uh, help them. Each, each trainee would go to about 100 people. I mean, it was, it was well-intentioned, but it, was, it had a ther therapy in mind. And I think, you know, anyone who knows a bit about the complexities of psychological functioning and the importance of having well-certified and well-trained and appropriately supervised psychological professionals dealing with people who may be suicidal and may be in extremely difficult circumstances working with people would, would really blanch at this idea. I mean, I wouldn't want someone doing heart surgery on me who had had a couple of weeks of training. And, uh, and well, you know, if, if I were someone who had, was feeling extremely vulnerable and torn up, you know, I wouldn't particularly want to have a person with a couple of weeks of training uh, working with me. So, you know, for me, these are, you know, this one was like a recipe for uh, potential disasters, even though it was very well uh, intentioned. If on the other hand, they had wanted to train people to do psychological first aid, that would be a totally different thing. Psychological first aid can be learned in a relatively short period of time. Certainly a week is enough, enough time to learn it. And uh, uh, you know, it, it is not a professional specialized form of uh, support, nor is it uh, therapy, but it is an extremely important uh, aspect of particularly in the first immediate days uh, when people are really quite vulnerable and brittle. It's, it's one of the components of a, of a comprehensive uh, approach. I'm not, familiar that, uh, with, sometimes with, I, I'm not familiar with the elements of psychological first aid. And so maybe you could take us through that. Sure, <clears throat> sure. I would recommend as a resource, there is an interagency guide on psychological first aid one can get it and other resources by going to the website uh, mhpss.net. That's mental health and psychosocial support.net. So mhpss.net. And uh, this particular manual developed by uh, War Child, by uh, War Trauma, <clears throat> uh, Netherlands, WHO, and several others. Uh, outlines uh, a variety of components which could be described as compassionate listening, empathy, accompaniment, uh, providing uh, accurate information where it's, where it's available, uh, avoiding making false promises, not trying to do therapy, playing a linking role with other services. They may be psychological services. If, for example, you see that, yes, someone is affected by an emergency, but you learn that they likely had a, a fairly profound mental disorder before the emergency, and maybe now they're in very difficult uh, shape, you know, that's someone who needs to be referred for specialized support. So how to make referrals, how to link with services of many different kinds, um, so these are the kinds of things that one uh, needs, needs to learn, and they need to be learned in an emergency context. So uh, many of us may have these skills in a so-called everyday context, but emergency contexts are, as you know, they're characterized by their overwhelming uh, nature, where you hardly know where to begin, particularly if people are showing up dying. You know, what do you do? Well, my response is you work with medical professionals and you help with the triage. Uh, 
and you don't go into that situation without knowing CPR. You know, it's just part of the, the lay of the land. And you do what needs to be done first. And then, you know, if you say, well, we'll do psychological first aid, it sounds so easy. Imagine uh, people pouring in. Uh, there are hundreds of them. Uh, many of them starving, some people having a, you know, a vague distant look of being overwhelmed, others crying, some screaming and maybe being hysterical, collapsing, fainting, uh, others coming up and begging you for water, food, you know, help, just wanting someone to listen. You know, where do you start? You know, if you start with the first people who come to you and then you don't listen to others, how does that make them feel? Does that tacitly privilege some people over others? And are those others who are not receiving your aid, are they the ones who are, who are worse off? Are they the ones who were discriminated against for the emergency? So there is no end of complexity. And in political conflicts, um, where the conflicts are internal, there may, may be hidden divisions, where there may be suspected spies, there may be suspected genocidaires or known spies and, and genocidaires among the population. And you may have no way of knowing when you're there doing psychological first aid. And so listening and learning through trusted interlocutors, and they have to be multiple interlocutors in order to triangulate and to try to ferret out whose version of truth and reality probably uh, is most accurate and, and is not you know, expressing a vested interest in one particular you know, political faction. These are very hard things to do. And sometimes, you know, I may be in a place as a psychosocial worker wanting to provide psychological first aid, but what happens if I see uh, a girl who's maybe 10 and she's unaccompanied and then she discloses that she had uh, been raped, you know, the, the night before? You know, what, what are my obligations? Should I stay and do psychosocial support or do I have obligations to report? And if I do report, what are the repercussions for her? What if it was a family member who had raped her? And what if the family member had told her, you know, you tell anyone about this and I will get you, meaning I'll inflict violence on you or maybe even kill you. These are questions for which I know of no simple answers. And one, you know, they're, they're riddled with complexity. But uh, so I urge everyone to learn psychological first aid who wants to work in humanitarian crises, whether in the US or, or elsewhere, but to do it with a, a respect for the enormous complexity of those, of those environments and to do it in a team-based modality. Because I think, you know, we solve these problems better together. And a big challenge in these areas, and it's a do no harm as well as other challenges, uh, is um, if we ourselves, if we don't take care of ourselves, we get overstressed and we become unable to make wise decisions. We may begin to bleed our own anxieties and tensions, and we uh, may begin to step beyond our role boundaries and to do things that are inappropriate and that actually cause as much harm as, uh, as good. Wow, <laughs> that's, a, that's quite a scene you've just painted. Uh, it's, I almost can feel the overwhelm of being in that sort of an environment. Um, and I guess part of the, you know, you were saying it would be good to get your training on the ground uh, to some extent with people who know the lay of the land and uh, can help yes. you in that specific situation. Yeah, you you talked about the importance if you of can't get trained in that situation. If you can't get trained in that situation, get training, get good psychological first aid training from people who've worked in multiple humanitarian crises who can uh, recreate the situations and role plays yeah. and reflections to really bring it home and let you feel the intensity, uh, the. Uh, you know, the confusion of it and the overwhelmingness of it yeah. and then help you, you know, think that through and reflect on what could be done better. You sound like you've been there. <laughs> I've been there. Yeah, I've in done that situation. I've yeah. done a lot, but I, you know, I have to say, I, I never reach a point where I feel like somehow I've, 
I've reached saturation with regard to learning. You know, every context is different, David, and one keeps keeps learning. Who are the natural helpers in one situation or not the natural helpers in another? Mm -hmm. What are the things that tear people up the most or may not be the ones you expect? So, you know, as a psychologist, I went into places like Angola thinking that trauma was going to be the biggest problem and that PTSD would be the main thing. Local people said, oh no, starvation is by far the more impactful thing. And it's particularly terrible if you're a parent and you can't feed your children. You're literally watching your children starve and you feel powerless despite the enormity of your love and your care for your children. And they said, if you want to know real psychological pain, that is it. Mm -hmm. Other people have told me, no, it's, it's not knowing where your loved ones are and fearing for their safety, or that that you know, is, is acidic on a scale and toxic in a way that, you know, that is in some ways even worse than receiving vast, you know, huge physical wounds. And so I'm not trying to diminish trauma and PTSD. I, you know, it is discernibly important, but it's just that, you know, oftentimes uh, one never stops learning the dizzying array of uh, local understandings of the of the impacts of these things and so to be able to go in with an open mind i think is really really crucial and to go in a spirit of co-learning rather than coming in as the expert so that alone keeps one keeps one fresh <laughs> um yeah the one of the th interesting things uh, that i took out of uh, uh what you've written is that people can go through horrific situations and come out without PTSD. Am I overstating the case? No, I don't think you are. I mean, uh, most of the evidence is that the majority of people exposed to even horrendous things like attack and rape and so on um, do not develop full-blown PTSD. <clears throat> um, in situations of armed conflict. However, there is an extremely important group of people and most evidence from WHO and others indicates that on average, there is a new burden of about 15% increase in PTSD cases. It is a very serious malady. It can produce not only immense suffering, but in comorbidity with uh, depression and other, other problems. <clears throat> and can render you quite dysfunctional, but it is uh, something that is very hard to address because of the lack of or shortage of psychological services. And it does have long-term implications. I mean, there's good evidence that this stuff persists over time and continues to, you know, uh, wreak neurological changes and and be hugely uh, problematic. Um, but my my question is. Are we looking in a manner that is sufficiently comprehensive and holistic? So there's uh, increasing evidence that problems like trauma are actually exacerbated by so-called everyday distresses, and that the people who are not resilient and who are unable to cope you know, with traumatic stress are oftentimes the people who are already worn down <clears throat> and who are addressing chronic problems I don't have a place for my family to live out on the streets and vulnerable, or we don't have enough food to feed our family, which is, as I've said, is really, really uh, extremely stressful for, for most parents. Or, uh, you know, not knowing where your loved ones are. So these things can actually mediate the way uh, one experiences trauma. And then a different way of saying this is that humans are makers of meanings. There are, for reasons we have not fully understood and analyzed yet, uh, some people who are able to find meaning uh, amongst, you know, even in situations of armed conflict and who are able to do reasonably well, better off than people who feel that all the violence is random and unpredictable and that it's really quite, and they're unable to, to make meaning of it. They mm -hmm. simply find their world turned upside down. Those latter people are more likely to uh, develop trauma. And then, of course, there's a huge dose effect 
It matters as to, you know, what is the magnitude of what you've experienced? It's chronicity, how long? It's multiplicity, how many times did you experience these stressors? And then whether you develop full-blown trauma depends not only on the bad things you experience, but on whether you were, had social support and had the presence of various protective factors, like being in a loving, caring relationship for a child uh, with, your, with your parents, being in the care of your parents. All of these things will influence your reaction as, as, as will heredity. And so I think that there is a, uh, um, you know, it's very simplistic to think that uh, everyone develops PTSD following exposure to horrendous life-threatening events. That, that is known to be uh, a bit simplistic. But it's also important not to think that because most people are reasonably resilient that they don't need support. Someone can be pretty resilient, for example, as a parent or as a child, <clears throat> and yet still need livelihood support or support in being able to go to school, uh, help dealing with uh, bullying or teasing or sexual harassment. There are a whole variety of supports that may be terribly uh, important. And uh, so resilience uh, is always a dynamic uh, sort of process. It's an outcome at a particular moment, but it changes over time depending upon the constellation of uh, risks and uh, protective factors and promotive factors, things that promote your well being. And so I think that we have to be uh, thinking preventively so that uh, in every situation, we don't treat people as if they're all traumatized, but we take steps to strengthen all those protective and promotive factors to uh, mediate the everyday distresses and to reduce the proportion of people whose reactions might convert to full-blown PTSD or depression. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we used to think that it was a good idea to have people relive the experience, you know, tell me what happened to you, give me the detail, go over it and over it again to desensitize them. I gather the wind has shifted around that. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is still contentious turf, <clears throat> but I would say there's more evidence today than there was even five years ago. That sometimes it's better not to talk about it and not to express. There's evidence from countries such as Bosnia and Northern Uganda that indicate that, and Mozambique, that indicates that people who avoid talking about it in particular cultural contexts where that is the norm, actually do better over the longer term than do people who express. And in some cases, expression makes people more vulnerable. So there used to be this tendency, as you said, to think that, oh, people need to debrief. And this you know, applies to humanitarian workers who've just come back from war zones, or it may apply to national staff in the war zones, and it certainly applies to refugee populations. But what happens if you're in a culture where there's uh, no history or norm of opening up, particularly with a stranger. That can not only be a very weird or unusual circumstance, something that one would tend not to do, but in the act of narrating your own pain and reliving those experiences, their reality comes back with full vigor and may leave you feeling completely vulnerable and traumatized and overwhelmed. And the problem is, the supports that are needed to address issues like suicide, the really profound levels of distress may not be there. And so I think ethically it's questionable to go in and pick people open uh, without having appropriate supports. And I think we have to attend to the culture and the context. If the culture <clears throat> indicates that it is not appropriate uh, to talk about your pain, uh, in wounds because that's calling attention to your own problems, you probably need to find another way of working. And what I would suggest is first learn what are the cultural modalities of coping and then do some studies to find out whether those modalities of coping are uh, unhealthy because not all coping is effective coping. I mean, sometimes people cope with pain by drinking too much or taking you know, illicit drugs. But that, of course, has long-term negative health consequences. But I think that uh, 
Um, oftentimes we just sort of assume that talking is healing when that might be true for Westerners, but it may not be true for some people in other societies. So I think we, it's part of our do no harm imperative to work in a culturally grounded and respectful way. And that recognizes that things may not work in exactly the same way. And if you go back to that child soldier in Angola, would talking about it really have helped that young man? There the answer is no. As a matter of fact, the belief was that even if you had received a traditional cleansing ritual, believed to purge you of the bad spirit, talking was believed to open the, reopen the door uh, for that bad spirit to enter one's life again. So it would actually reduce one's well-being. So to do good healing and psychosocial and mental health support work in these war zones, we really have to listen carefully uh, to local culture. And part of my advice is to get good cultural interlocutors who help you understand uh, the richness and the diversity, not to romanticize it, but at least to not stumble over it or do things that are disrespectful and put people in harm's way. You know, I think that might be a good place for us to wrap up our conversation. It, uh, it uh, condenses a lot of what you've had to say. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap this up? Only, only this, David, it is that uh, the refugee crisis is one that uh, demands concerted action, I think, by every human being. When I look at them, uh, my response is there, but for the grace of God, go I. I mean, if we had been born into Syria, if we'd been born into Sudan, we would likely be on, you know, in these situations. So I hope that we can all roll up our sleeves and do our help even right here in the, in the U.S. It's, it's our time to shine and to try to do the, the compassionate thing for people in their, in their hour of need. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Michael Wessels, Dr. Michael Wessels, Professor Michael Wessels, uh, for mm -hmm. sharing the uh, very inspiring and challenging work that you've been doing on Shrink Wrap Radio. Thanks very much, David. It's been a pleasure talking with you today.